But today I'm going to talk about a, a book that just came out. Actually, I'm going to let it circulate. I think I sent to you already the manuscript. Uh, but of those of you have, who have not looked at it yet, I want it back because it's my only copy in Paris. Uh, and I want to show off, right? So, <laughs> right. Incidentally, for the uh, options B and C, either tonight or tomorrow, I'm going to send you another book, which I'm going to use for my course that starts on Monday, which is called Finance-Led Capitalism. Right. Uh, slightly different, but co still connected. The connection between the two is that we're talking about two different uh, periods of capitalist evolution. One that has uh, already taken hold, which is finance-led capitalism, and has produced uh, something like a systemic crisis, whose peak we celebrated 10 years, I mean, whose, whose anniversary we just celebrated. Um, the other one, eco-capitalism, is a possible one for the future. And uh, I call it ca eco-capitalism, even though I'm completely aware of the fact that ecological capitalism seems to be an oxymoron. But that's precisely the point, right? Uh, we, we can no longer continue along the path we have chosen uh, in the evolution of our economic system until now. We need a break, a fundamental break, or we will be broken. And so we're facing a huge threat, and it's the threat that will define your lives. I will be dead, and I will probably be happy to have died, if there's any such sentiment to be had after life, which I don't believe in. I'll be ashes. Uh, but uh, if I were around, <laughs> right, because if we don't do anything about this, uh, it's going to be a serious issue, right? But it's going to be a challenge that is both an opportunity and a danger. Uh, and so we need to talk about that. Uh, so yes, so I'm basically, by eco-capitalism, I'm basically meaning an ecologically oriented system of capitalism, which does not exist yet, right? Needs to be constructed. Uh, that's one thing. The other thing is that in order to construct this adequately, we also have to rethink both economics and finance. And that's a very, very interesting thing to do. Uh, the standard growth models don't have any ecological dimension to them. As a matter of fact, nature has been banned. First, nature was turned into land, right, as a notion, starting even with Ricardo already 200 years ago. The physiocrats and Smith even had some sense of nature, but Ricardo turned it into land, and Marshall turned land into capital. Uh, and after that, the entire ecological system within which our economy is embedded just became a form of capital. Uh, and then uh, the logic of that to be pushed further, this is known as Hartwig's rule, is to justify degradation of some element of capital if it, if it brings you about an increase in other forms of capital. So we can degrade the environment if that makes us richer or happier. And along that logic, we have justified environmental degradation now for 160 years to the point where now the environment is going to bite us back. Right? Uh, so we need to kind of rethink economics in the sense that the environment has to re-enter the picture as such, as an, as an ecological system that is actually bigger than our economy. Uh, and in order to do that, the link between ecology and economics has to be also to re-socialize economics, right? Economics has to be connected to so reconnected to society in terms of social relations, and then as such has to be embedded in, in, in the environment, right? That's a very different conception than the one we have developed, uh, especially in orthodox economic theory, but even in most of heterodox economic theory, right? So that's one thing that's important to do here, right? Uh, this, this is beginning to, this is already beginning as a process, right? I have about four or five pages at the end of chapter four on, on the, new, the new theme of ecological macroeconomics. Right? And what that might be, right? Uh, and, uh, and the kinds of models that may be useful in that regard, right? 
So, so that's one thing. Right? Uh, the other thing that is fundamentally important here is that we have until now looked at pollution as an externality. And this will no longer suffice. Okay. What, is an, what is an externality? Does anybody know? Anybody want to say something about that? Yes. Right, that's a good beginning, yes. Correct, right. So yes, yeah, so when you look, I'm going to take that a bit further, right? So it's important to understand what externalities are, and then it's important to understand why climate change is not an externality, okay? Why we have to think of it differently than, than just pollution, right? Uh, so, when you, when, when you take traditional ma microeconomic analysis, right, you, you take, you're analyzing basically uh, um, exchange transactions, right, between buyers and sellers, right? And these exchange transactions uh, take place because both sides see a benefit in, 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 in exchanging with each other, right? And typically the buyer pays money and then obtains a good or service or an asset and the seller uh, you know, the benefit there is the money gotten and then the good service or asset given up and either of those good service or assets have, have incurred some cost to be produced and then delivered to the buyer, right? What I'm trying to say is that in, in the standard approach uh, to exchange transaction, which is microeconomics, we take account, both sides take account immediate costs and benefits that accrue to them individually, right? And, uh, and then in the process ignore spillover effects to others that their transaction causes, okay? Their transaction causes spillover effects. And the spillover effects may be good, the spillover effects may be bad, right? You're an example of such externality, why? Sitting here, you're an example of an externality. Huh? Education. Education, yes. You sitting here, for all that it's worse, right, is, is beneficial to not just you. And of course, it's beneficial to your parents being proud of you or be crying the fact that you have flown far away and will never return to your country. But they're willing to give you up, right? Uh, but it's also beneficial for, you know, let's say, wherever you end up. You know, the country that you end up uh, rooting yourself in uh, will get some benefit from your education that is far beyond your own salary increase that EPOC will give you, hopefully. <laughs> right? And in that sense, you are given a grant. Even if you're not given a grant, you're sitting here in a subsidized structure as hot as it is. Because it's subsidized, it also doesn't have any air conditioning, right? I teach in New York, everything's air conditioning there because people pay $50,000 to hear me, right? Uh, but that's different, but not quite different, right? It's just a question of the balance between what is private and what is public. That is a social question, a political question, right? For the US, a lot of public is private, more than here. Uh, so we don't, have a, we don't have a healthcare system that is automatically a public good. We don't have an education system that's automatically a public good. We being the Americans, I'm from New York. Right? Uh, I'm originally Austrian, but I'm, I'm, I live in New York. Uh, so, now, the most important negative externality is a social cost called pollution. Right? And uh, that's a spillover effect of the production and sometimes even the consumption of goods and services, right, that have an environmentally negative impact. By cars, right? Uh, you know, you drive around a car, you pollute. And that has a spillover effect on anybody who has to breathe uh, the, the air, the combined air of all those cars. Uh, 
Now, how do we deal with externalities so far? What's, what's, what do we do? Yes. We what was the first thing? No, no, we're not there at cap and trade. That, let's not jump. That's a, that's a very specific construct. You're not capping trading my cigarette smoke, are you? Which is a negative externality. Just generally, what do you do? You try to force the buyers and sellers to internalize that which now is external. Okay? You try to make them account for the fact that their, their production or consumption, which gets combined in this exchange transaction between them, causes socially harmful effects, spillover effects that are negative. You try to make them pay for it. Or you try to incentivize them to do less of that. Right? And how do you do that? How do you internalize what is otherwise an externality? What are the tools to do that? Sorry? Well, yeah, right. You have to make them pay compensation, or if they're socially beneficial activities, then you comp compensate them for that, right? Uh, yourself. But what does that really mean? Beyond that single word lies a lot. Okay. Yeah, you can. Okay, so you can tax negative, and you can subsidize positive externalities, right? You, as a positive externality, an embodiment of a positive externality, you are being subsidized, and you will feel the end of it. I can tell you that, <laughs> right? When you're no longer subsidized, that is an imminent prospect, right? right so you've lived nicely, right? Yes. Essentially, what you're doing is changing the relative prices. Exactly. You need to, I mean, one of the great problems that we have is that things are mispriced, right? Cap, it's a market failure to the extent that things are mispriced, right? You could argue, for example, that oil is far too cheap and therefore we will live in hell, right? There's a, real, there's a big, I mean, ultimately, one way to look at this is a pricing problem. Right? They're the wrong signals. Yes? Yes, that's the other approach. You just regulate. You say, you mess, you're going to pay a penalty. Or we're going to tell you how not to mess. Right? Uh, we're going to put, like, we're going to put, uh, you know, emissions controls into your machinery. Uh, we will also punish you if you go beyond a certain limit of negative externalities, right? We can punish you, right? So there's either taxes, which is basically trying to correct the pricing problem, or regulation, which is a quantity uh, approach, right? Uh, of how much, how much negative externalities you allow to happen, right? And by the way, between those two are political differences, right? Uh, the conservatives, uh, uh, lib what you call liberal, not the American version of liberal, but the, liberals, the liberal solution or the conservative solution is, pr is precisely to, to do it by changing the price structure and the relative prices, that is, using taxes. Right. Uh, whereas, whereas the more left-wing solution, if I will put it like that, is, is to regulate, right? The problem that we have is that climate change is not an externality, even though until now we have dealt with it as an externality. Right. So there's two issues. One, one, one is that uh, how have we dealt with climate change so far? Well, we have ignored it, right? But, uh, you know, gradually we, it dawns on us that that's not the best approach. So, so we have made an effort, right, on some level. And I will talk to you about the effort. And the effort should not be belittled, right? While it is clearly inadequate as an effort, right, it is such an enormous governance issue, global governance issue, that having done what we have done already is quite amazing, right? But not enough by any, by any standards, right? So we have to look at it as half full, half empty, right? Yes? Um, well, we try to incentivize, basically, like follow the economic rational 
I'm saying is that climate change pollution is caused by pollution, and pollution is an external right. production. So we need to incentivize producers. But what have we done so far? What has Sweden done, for example, as opposed to <laughs> California? Yes, yeah, so Sweden, for example, has a carbon tax that's very high, right? I mean, we also have incentives. Yeah, but you have, a, I mean, if you're Swedish, right? I don't know whether you're aware of this, but, you know, Sweden is the leader in carbon taxes in the world, right? And it's about 138 euros worth of carbon tax per ton. It's a lot. So you have not ignored it, right? I don't know what the Swedish uh, Democrats will do. Uh, because the extreme right is not into that kind of shit, but uh, we'll see. Right. Carbon taxes. What else? There was, you said it already there. Cap and trade, yeah. What's cap and trade? Yeah. Is there a limit on emissions on over uh, territory? Or yes. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, of pollution permits. Yes, yes. Yes, right, right, right. You try to solve the problem with the market, right? By, by creating a, marketable, a marketable product, uh, making the social cost a marketable product in terms of emission permits, right? So you set limits, you cap emissions, right? And you cap emissions by giving emission permits. Yes? And also then lately that we shifted from the focus only on production also to consumers. Mm -hmm. And um, that we try to incentivize consumers to go for more environmental friendly to produce products, right. Right. recycled products. But we also have regulated when you, for example, look at initiatives taken for banning plastics, plastics right. or something, something. More and more. Yeah. Yes. So right. So we have a third approach, which basically is trying to get what we call scope three emissions under control, right? By th these are the ones that are caused by the products when they're getting used, when they're getting consumed, right? And, and uh, so we're trying to tell consumers, uh, well, you should do this and you shouldn't do that and this and that, right? And sometimes we subsidize them to do this. So we're going to subsidize, for example, the use of electricity vehicles, you know, uh, electricity-based vehicles. Uh, uh, or we kind of have a moral suasion kind of a s strategy. Don't use straws, right, <laughs> when you go to Starbucks, uh, which is now a big campaign in the U.S. Uh, that has to do with the plastic in the oceans, right? Because we have a sense that in 40, if tra current trends continue, there will be no fish left in 40 years. And we try to figure out what that means and how that can be avoided, right? So eventually, you know, some of us are beginning to think uh, in longer term and try to kind of figure out something. But I want to go back to the cap and trade thing, right? Uh, so you have cap and trade. First you cap and then you trade, right? What you cap are emissions, emissions of greenhouse gases. Okay. So you, basically you're setting limits you're looking at the most polluting industries above all, and you tell them, okay, that's it. You can emit so much. And we give you emission permits, right? So if we can, you know, if you have a thousand tons of carbon dioxide, we're going to give you, a, you know, a thousand certificates, each one of them being worth a ton per year. And what's important here is that if you, if you have, and this is the trading part, right? If you, if, you, if, you, if you pollute less than your allowed limit, right? What happens then? Yes? You can sell your permits, yes. You haven't used them all up, right? You can sell your permits to whom? To whom would you sell the permits to? Huh? Yeah, to those who want to pollute more, correct. So those who, want to who, who are able to pollute less than allowed, they can make some money and hence get incentivized to pollute less. 
so that they can then sell for those to those who pollute more or above their limit, right? That's the idea. The idea also was to tighten the limits over time and thereby push up the price of those certificates, right? This has never happened yet. Right? That's a problem, right? So does anybody know what happened? <clears throat> what happened to the cap and trade markets? Let's say the biggest one is in the European Union. The EU ETS, yes? Right. Yeah, price collapsed. The price was like, the price got to, I don't know, I forgot, but it, it was at 1.30 euros for like two weeks and then it went all the way up down to like 11 cents. Uh, it, it's extremely volatile and by and large the trend is going down rather than up, right? Right now it's about six euros a ton, right? Uh, Specialists agree that the actual price right now should be at least 50. Right? Six is a long way from 50. Okay. Uh, but 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 we are about for a while still uh, s set to uh, use this mechanism more, right? In the Paris Agreement, there's definitely a bias towards using that approach, right? The, you should, by the way, also know as economists that. The cap and trade uh, regimes, those carbon markets, as they're also called, they, 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 they represent one tradition to deal with externalities, right? You have the tax, the tax, the idea of emissions taxes. But who came to this idea? Which economist? Pigou, yes. Pigou. So we call them also Pigovian taxes. Right? They're specific types of taxes. They're emissions taxes, right? Uh, Arthur Pigou, and uh, pretty much at the same time, the beginning of the 20th century, there was another guy who ultimately uh, you know, won the Nobel Prize for this work. Coase, Roland Coase, C-O-A-S-E, and Coase. Yeah, for Coes, it's all about property rights, you know, and distributing property rights and negotiating property rights and using the market mechanism to, you know, uh, establish and negotiate property rights. He says ultimately it doesn't, it doesn't matter who has the property rights to begin with as long as they're transferable, right? Uh, and, and so, yeah, this is a Coesian, Coesian approach. Uh, Coase is an interesting economist, right? I mean, true and true, liberal, neoliberal, but he's a very interesting guy, right? Um, anyway, doesn't matter. The problem we have is that the climate change is far more profound than that, okay? It'll never be resolved just by carbon taxes. It'll never be resolved just by cap and trade. It's far beyond that. It's a much, much deeper problem, right? Because, because the pollution here is overwhelming, right? Uh, and, and, and the effects of this pollution that we are beginning to enter uh, into, in, in terms of, uh, of, of climate change are, are profound. They are systemically destructive, right? They basically threaten our, not only our planet, but our species. Right? So externalities are, are relatively limited problems, okay? This is a huge, this is an overwhelming problem. It's not a limited problem, right? In other words, to, to face this problem, you have to change everything. Okay? You have to change what you eat. Okay? You have to change how you get around. You have to change your buildings, how you heat them, how you cool them. Right, so uh, it's 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 it requires a fundamentally different uh, both industrial production apparatus, as well as a, a remaking of social relations. Right. Neither the state nor the private profit incentive will will itself be sufficiently capable of addressing this issue, which also gives a huge chance for a third 
layer of the economy to develop, which is the social part of the economy, the social and solidarity economy, the commons. So this is also an incredible political opportunity okay, to change capitalism at the face of threat that is existential. Typically, when you have a noose around your neck, you start thinking. Okay. So this is will, this basically will be defining your life. I can assure you of that, right? Whatever you little, you know, whatever niche you carve out for yourself, this is the defining issue. All the many other issues derive from that, like migration, for example. But as I already implied, uh, it's a it's a governance issue as well. It's a, it's a politically difficult issue to deal with. Yes. 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 Listen, listen. I, as I look, look, I, look, look, look. Let me tell you something, right? Uh, of course, I'm a privileged person, right? I'm a professor in two different places. I get a beautiful salary and so forth, right? So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not your average person at this point, right? But I used to. I'm, 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 I'm from Salzburg, right? I'm an alpine man. I used to ski in the summer. The best thing you can ever do. Right? But when you ski in the summer, it's glaciers, you know? When you go to the glacier that I used to go to, which is in Zillertal, the glacier doesn't exist anymore. But when the glacier doesn't exist anymore, glaciers feed rivers. And if the glacier is not there anymore, what happens to the rivers? There is a bad river for a long time before there's no river, right? And cities, when they're not on the coast, they're on rivers. Budapest is on a river. Vienna is on the same river. Innsbruck is on a, a different river, right? Salzburg is on a different river as well. They're all connected, by the way. The Inn Super. Uh, let's just, I mean, then think, think geographically, right? Take the Andes, right? The Andes go through all of Latin America and they feed the coastal communities of Latin America on the Pacific, right? Take Lima. Imagine Lima without glaciers 50 kilometers from Lima. Just imagine it. I think the people of Lima will so suddenly notice that they have no water. Right? It's not too late. It is never too late. What's too late is to think that there's no problem. Right? Yeah, you can say, let's go to the Mars, but only, only Elon Musk will say that, okay? Because he thinks there's a billion dollars worth of profits to be had before he gets actually imprisoned for being crazy, right? Look, human history is full of creating problems, finding solutions, and then creating problems out of those solutions, okay? Unless you want to say, okay, this is it. We've had our nice little run. We were only in the history of the planet for five minutes. Let the cockroaches take over. And the rats, they're smart. They're very smart. They may be smarter than us. Let them do it. But I'm not sure we're there yet, right? Maybe in 200, 300, 500, maybe 2,000 years from now. I don't know, right? It's not too late. The question is, you know, do you do something to contain the problem before it becomes really, really bad? Or do you wait for it to get really, really bad and then adapt to it? Okay, so one of the issues about climate change is mitigation versus adaptation, right? And I can tell you something. Mitigation is better than adaptation because preventing a problem is better than trying to address the problem, right? The problem is here already, but it, the problem can have a fairly manageable degree, a catastrophic degree, or much in between, right? And I'm going to talk about this in a minute, right? Uh, what's also true is that this is a generational problem. My generation is not able to do this. My generation is fossil fuel dedicated. Right? And it's, it's your generation who has to do this, right? My generation can teach about it, right? Uh, or can kind of prepare the political ground for it, but they, my generation cannot deal with this, right? 
for a lot, a lot of reasons we can talk about later. Uh, it's your generation. But the problem is that we all have kids, right? So I have kids, right? And by the way, yeah, I mean, I go, the other thing that my, my, I do is I, went, I, went to, I always went to a place that I love, which is called Belize. Who knows Belize? Uh, where is that? It's in the Caribbean. What's, what's important about Belize, apart from the Mayan ruins and the rainforest being beautiful? What, what is important there? Yes, it has the second largest coral reef. So you don't go to the Great Barrier Reef, which is in the northeastern uh, part of Australia. That's a little too far. Belize is right next to New York, right? <laughs> basically. Yeah? So you can go there and you can scuba dive. That's the other great experience, right? Scuba diving, you know, you, then you're not no longer f afraid of sharks, you know, they're like manta rays, beautiful, man. You have, a, you have a respect for nature that just, even if you're as cynical a person as I can be, it, it blows you with tears. Of course, you don't have tears because you're in water. But I took my kids back, and I haven't been there for like 15 years until I went back with them, and the, the reefs were basically dying. There were less than half the amount of fish there than the first time I went there, which was in 1982. And then you realize that the richest ecosystem of the ocean is dying. And what does that mean, right? Because that's the beginning of a fish chain, right? A food chain for fish. Uh, so if you have a chance, as I had, to go for glaciers and then for coral reefs, you realize how incredibly intense the problem has already become, right? But then I also walk on the you know, southern tip of Manhattan. I live on Union Square, which is not too far, right? But my, my, two of my best friends live down, I mean, work downtown, near where 9-11 uh, happened. And when you walk around there, you, see the, you actually literally see the rising sea level. Between 1978, when I came to New York, and now the sea level is perhaps you know, a bit more than the bottle. When you think about the fact that you know, 40%, 40 percent of the human population live within 10 meters from the sea level, height-wise, you got a problem. You got a really big problem. Okay, in terms of coastal cities. Let's not even cry about Venice. Right? Cry about Manhattan. The one thing that my, made, bo made both of my kids eco ecologists right, uh, is Sandy, a hurricane in late October hitting New York City as a Category 4 storm okay, in 2012 and causing an incredible amount of damage. The subway line that I'm look, uh, using, the L train, is going to be shut down for two years because the tunnels have been so damaged that they couldn't sustain them. They were trying to, right? Um, so it's, it's, yes, they will notice. That's my answer to your question. People will notice, and they will notice it more and more and more. When you have wildfires in Siberia, the Russians will say, what the fuck is going on here? Right. Hmm? Sorry? It's fake news, yes, but then, then the, fires, uh, the fires create their own problems. Yes. Yeah, I mean, they are just had these devastating storms in, in the U.S., and right. we still have a huge group of people, particularly under the current administration, yes. that yes. says this has nothing to do with climate change. Yes. So I feel just like either you have more polarization in the society, you have yes. peop more people denying it, and you have more, like, you don't have these people in between that say, oh, I don't care, but you probably have more. The one said, oh, okay, we have an actual problem, and then the other saying, oh, this is a natural change. No, 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 but that's exactly, that's a very important process, right? It's, it's how should I put this, right? But fundamental breakthroughs in thinking, right, are not linear, right? They come in, in, in a very, very tightly dialectical process, right? So, so, I mean, Galileo had to be killed to realize that the Earth is round, right? Uh, you, you know, it's, it's, it, the, the fact that there's a polarization is exactly necessary in a way, right? Because people, people realize the reason why people don't like it is because they live in West Virginia and they want their coal back, right? And, uh, and they want their large cars. And they realize that if they logically think through this problem, large cars will be banned. No more large cars for Americans. And if you're an American, no more large cars is a disaster. Because you're sitting there driving, 
with everybody else in a large car and if it, everybody's stuck in traffic and everybody, you want to have a house, you want to have your TV, you want to have your little uh, microwave in your car. Of course, it is that car that causes this mess that makes you dependent on that car. But that's the, that's, and when it dawns on you, when that dawns on you, you say, wait a minute, there's a problem there. And the first reaction to the problem is, nah, I can live without this problem. Of course it's a social issue. I just told you that it's not an externality. It's how we have organized our economy. Right? But this is also why there's resistance to it, right? Because you, ha you have a sense that if once you go down to accept this as a problem, you're going to have to change capitalism fundamentally. And a lot of vested interests do not want to change it because they're going to get devalued. The problem, this, this, this political issue, right, about whether it's, whether, how to do, deal with it has to do with vested interests and with the fear of change and the fact that everybody senses, when you start thinking about it, this is a revolutionary problem. This is a revolutionary problem in the truest sense of the word. And it's difficult to accept that, right? Revolutionary problem in the sense that you have to transform the way you organize living, right? Um, I mean, if you say that climate change is not just an externality, and you say I don't understand um, the reading you had to do today, I, I must admit... What readings have you had to do for I today? Chapter 6 and 7. Right, right, right. Okay, then I'm going to get to that. Yeah, but basically what you suggest... It's a beautiful question. In, in your <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, yeah, it's all about... <coughs> Mm, no, I think the argument. Well, maybe, maybe you should. Yeah, okay, maybe it's a problem. No. Okay. Okay. Right. 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 Part of it has to do with just being chapters six and seven. Right. Uh, two and eight. Uh, what I'm talking about here, right? But, but there's also, I'm going to be with you in a sec, there's also the need to have very pragmatic ideas all the way to more ambitious ideas, all the way to more utopian ideas. You have to have a way. You have to, have, you have to think about a discussion to have, right? And the discussion has to have content, right? And the content has to do with policy. And you have to figure out a way from here to there. And you cannot, you cannot ever uh, just like create magical wants. You have to have very pragmatic ways of thinking about issues. And you also have to listen to the, to the crazies. And you have to listen to the opposition. And you have to listen to you know, the prevailing set of ideas and why they're not enough and so forth. You have to learn how to do that, right? If you have EPOG. There's the P and the G, right? You, you're not going to get to the G by just lowballing P. Okay? You have to be P. P is your job, right? What I talk about is my lecture. What I think about practically are my, you know, like, like a, a way, how, to, how can you do, redo finance a bit, you know, and then a bit more, and then a bit more, right? But in the end, you will see that the, in the end, you can project the ideas can get more and more ambitious once there's a base for them, and they can actually then get to be quite radical. Right. Yeah, you had a question. Yeah, and I just, I mean, I agree on this being a, have very much a social and political problem because these are the ones that have to at least start the process of creating infrastructures that can change the way people live and, and, and the way they behave. And, and also you, you write about you know, connecting these private and public actors, but it's kind of difficult because what are the incentives for the private ones? Unless you create good ways of, you know, yes, to that's a talk about all of that, right? So I gave you my introductory third, right? My introductory third is, okay, this is a, you know, 
an amazing problem, right? And it, co it goes beyond the confines, the conceptual confines of how we've been thinking about it, right? And so it, the answer is a transformation, right? And that's eco-capitalism, right? Uh, and there's a, there's a twist to that story, which is that, and this goes back to your question, right? The most likely scenario is that we will do nothing or not much about this, and then we will panic, right? And then and the panic will be maybe in eight or ten years, right? And then it's going to be really interesting to see what happens because then things can get very, very wrong very fast, right? It's, you, people usually don't do their best job thinking through things together collectively when they're in a panic. Right? So in a way, we have to prepare for that panic, right? Uh, but that's just, I'm setting this aside, right? The possible other alternative is that we follow through, the, we follow through even though Trump took the U.S. out of this, the, 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 the intended logic of the Paris Agreement, right? Because the Paris Agreement is actually pretty amazing on the one hand, even though it's clearly too late, too little on the one hand, right? It, has, it, it does set up a, a, a mechanism, right, a process. So let's talk first a bit about the Paris Agreement because we do need to understand it, right? The ins and outs of it. So what do you know about the Paris Agreement? December 2015, the Climate Accord. Do you know anything about it? Uh, yes? Yes. So the or, or it's what? Still, we if we still reach the two percent degree, uh, like the, the amount uh, of the carbon dioxide in the air is just the two percent that we reach two degree A, and also it's not mandatory for the states. Mandatory, right? Okay, it's not binding, right? Right, right. And right. So there's an objective, right? The objective is to keep the cumulative average increase in the temperature, global temperature to two degrees Celsius from pre-industrial levels, okay? So the, 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 the baseline is pre-industrial, okay? Which means 1850. Just want to say that we are already at plus one. Yeah, well, 0. 0.9, but yes, we're close to one. We already have one degree. And most of that one degree, 0. 0.7, came f since 1975. And the, the last three uh, tenths are just in a year, uh, in, in less than a decade, right? So there's a clear acceleration of temperature rise, right, already, right? And even 0 0.9 causes a lot of stress to the system, right? A 0 0.9 increase in the average temperature means that Paris has, will have from now on, at least 25 days over 30 degrees temperatures, which it never had before. Never. It, I've been in Paris since I was a kid, regularly in the summer. I've spent every summer here since 1981. 30 degrees for the Parisians in 1984 or in 1987 was a flip moment, okay? Right? Now it's 30 degrees on the 10th of September. Paris will soon be like Seville. Seville this summer, what was the top temperature in Seville this summer, do you know? 47 degrees. New record in Europe. Right, think about that. <laughs> 47 degrees is warm. I've been to in 43 degrees temperatures, and you're like, dead! You're dead. You can barely raise your arm. It's crazy. So, but that's not just it. It's, you have storms, right? Because the water warms, right? Uh, the water rises, the water warms. You have droughts. Above all, the most pronounced temperature increase is where? 
in terms of looking at all the Gulf streams, jet streams, great corridor flows of the weather system, where are the largest increases in temperature? Huh? The Arctic. The Arctic and the Antarctic, second. And that means what? Ice is melting. Ice is melting, right. And that means what? Sea levels are rising, that's one problem. Huh? Exponential temperature increase, why? Because of less bright surface in the Earth. Yes, this is a cumulative problem, right? Not only that, you have also something, I don't even know, I don't, I don't hear people talk about this, right? But as the, as the, the poles melt, the salt content of the oceans gets diluted because it's all f this is all fresh water, right? And the, the, the dissolution of the salt content changes what is called the Great Corridor. The Great Corridor is a deep flow in the oceans that is totally fundamental to our climate. It regulates the jet streams and the Gulf streams. So we, it's not just global warming, it's a totally transformative change in the dynamic, in the meteorological dynamic of climate that we're facing. This issue has not yet been discussed, right? I've, I mean, I, I look at the, I, I mean, I look at this, the, the, you know, the reports of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. They're, they discuss that, and it's really very good reading, but it's also horrifying reading, right? Uh, the IPCC assessment reports. All right, so we have issues. I mean, I can go through a lot of different aspects of climate change. I can tell you that there's going to be pandemics, that insects will bite you, and you will be sick. And then this will be contagious diseases. Droughts create desertification. Desertification creates conflicts over land that's shrinking. Syria is an example of that. Okay. Syria is an artificial state. It's a very tribal culture. Okay. And, uh, and the tribal culture expresses itself in cities, in competing cities, right? This is a story that's been going on there for 6,000 years. The oldest cities in the world come uh, in Syria, right? Damascus and Aleppo is the oldest city in the world, okay? Uh, you had a four-year drought before Syrian civil war, okay? Which reduced the arable land by 32%. In an already overcrowded country, Syria has 31 million people. It's a small place, okay? Uh, when the Arab Spring came, that just fueled, the stoked precious land conflicts that were already there, right? And of course, you have a minority government, you know, the Alawites, and they are Shiites, and there's already a civil war going on thanks to 9-11 and the U.S. response. You have now a civil war between the Shiites and the Sunnis stretching from, uh, you know, Pakistan all the way to Algeria. Right? It's like the Protestants and the Catholics. How long did that war last? Right? Uh, so in a way, we are also slow motion entering a third world war, right? Because of course, all the big powers are involved in that conflict, in that civil war. Right? But the point that I'm trying to make, more inter interestingly and importantly, is that there will be huge migration waves. And the Syrian, is, the Syrian failed state is just the first one, right? We expect 700 million people to be on the move in 2050. Right? And we only had like five, six million people on the move in Syria, and that created already a lot of problems, uh, as you well know, politically, if you're, for example, in Germany, or Austria, or Hungary, or Slovenia, or Croatia. It's not just soccer. Right? It's also kill the Muslim. Um, so yeah. Right. But the Paris Agreement, what else does it do? How does it try to deal with this issue? The, keep the temperature. By the way, there's a, there's, there was a great moment when there was an agreement not only to cap it at 2%, which is the goal of what they now call the low carbon transition, 
but to keep it closer to 1.5%, if possible. Right? That's important, because there's the implication of an ambition. 1.5% right? uh, uh, degrees is a little bit more than we have now. That's entirely manageable. Okay? I mean, it's, it's awful, but it's manageable. 2% right? is quite manageable, too, a little bit more difficult. Anything beyond that is, 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 is better not think about it too much because you're going to get too depressed. But anyway, uh, so what do we do in the Paris Agreement to make this work? Yes? Yeah, there's, there's going to have to be a fairly large amount of transfer, ref, uh, tr transfer and financial resources, right? Technolo sorry, technological resources and transfer of financial resources from the rich to the poorer countries, yes. They, they created a mechanism for that. Does anybody know what it's called? The Green Climate Fund, yeah, which is supposed to be scaled up to $100 billion a year by 2020. Uh, well, it was 27 or something, and then Trump took out the American contribution from it. But there's going to be two meetings to make that, to make, I mean, to scale it up, right? They're, they're imminent. Uh, so there's, there's work. I mean, people understand that this is not happening and enough, fast enough, and that it needs to be beefed up and so forth. There's two meetings planned for that. Uh, so, yes, so what else? What else? What else? What else? Yes? Question two percent, I mean... Two, two degrees, sorry. Uh, sorry, yeah. My mistake first. Um, this percentage, I mean, shouldn't this be more based off what every country can do? That's exactly what happened. Your question is to be answered, yes, exactly. That's what they did. Like Sweden, I mean, we're doing a lot, but we could do even more. So right. So what we have the abilities to do so, but then... Wait, no, 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 let's, 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 let's go slow. Should we drop the stringency of the previous statement? Global coordination to go to nationally defined contributions? Yes, that's crucial. That is crucial. They're not called nationally defined, they're called nationally determined contributions. What's the NDCs? NDCs. Nationally determined contributions. That's crucial. Remember that. Huh? Yes, degrees. correct. Even two degrees is very ambitious. Because at yeah. this level, some scientists already think that there might be feedback loops. That yeah, yeah, there, there are. Things. Yes. But l look, again, a little thing is better than nothing, right? It's really important that we understand that, right? Please, I, I love your youth fervor, right? And your radicalism, but also stay pragmatic in your radicalism, right? Understand that small steps are better than no steps. Always argue for more steps. And small steps that are, up, that are scalable are especially useful, right? That's, that it's like a baby starting to walk like a toddler, and the toddler walking then running around on a soccer field. So let's talk about the NDCs, the Nationally Determined Contributions, right? So we had 198 countries sign this, okay? Yes? Um, in a, uh, I also think of this in, in a way of, okay, these are like investments we have to do. We yes. can invest in reducing, but that's, it's not just an easy thing that you can do. No, it's not. A year. Let's say we have a goal for 2020, and maybe we need to do an investment that goes over until 2040. Even that is a short-term horizon. Even that. Anyhow. Yes, what's your question? Trains instead of flights. Right. Any types of infrastructure. Then maybe you cannot attain this, you know, whatever uh, decrees you're supposed to do in the years that have been set. No. You because, can. like in Sweden, we have these issues with, okay, we will invest more in different types of uh, infrastructure, but it's too expensive. So they don't to do it, and it's risky. They don't know how much it's going to you know, result. Right, right, right. You have an issue there as well. You cannot appropriate you know, the benefits before it happens, so then you cannot count. Them. Right, 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 right. You, look, can I answer? I think this is going to be the most important answer I'm going to give you today. 
you, you have to just completely change the way you think about investments and the time horizon involved with this, right? And, uh, and that's, that's the challenge here, right? You have to think over a 100 to 300 year time horizon. And the moment you start thinking through, even as a business, climate change, you start thinking this through, you realize, okay, 20 years is nothing. <laughs> 100 years, 300, I mean, so we have the, the, the most advanced impact assessment models that we have, right, in the University of Cambridge and uh, where's the other one, in Yale, <clears throat> you have these specialists, right, incredible economists, by the way, right, uh, Christopher Hope and William Nordhaus, uh, and Richard Toll also, right, they are the, they are the greatest uh, environmental economists in terms of long-term projections, right, and they have this, what they call IAM, impact assessment models, and they're trying to build them now for 300 years. Right? Uh, so, yeah, right, that's one thing, right, but to, to, to on this question, I have to tell you something, right, I, wanna, I want you to read something that is, has very much touched me, because I used to know this guy when he was young and right-wing, and I realize now he's no longer just a right-wing schmuck. Uh, I'm talking about a guy called Mark Carney. Does that name ring a bell at all? Yeah, huh? Yeah, he's the governor of the Bank of England, yeah. But he also used to, some, used to be the central bank governor of Bank of Canada when he was a right-wing schmuck. Then he got a bit better when he took over the Bank of England, but he also took over something else that's crucial that I will talk to you about a lot in the financial institutions, financial, uh, international finance and uh, institutions course. What does he head? Hmm? No, he's actually, he's housed in the building that has, has the Basel. Uh, Basel is the Bank for International Settlements, but he's not heading that. But he's heading an organization that's affiliated with that, that's also affiliated with the G20. It's, it's the link between the two. It's called the Financial Stability Board, the FSB. And the FSB is a sort of an organization that was set up in 2009 uh, to basically figure out the great financial dangers that we face. Right? And so they've been working on shadow banking, which is basically the Monday course you will have. Uh, but they also have been working on climate finance, right? And uh, which is what I wanted, I've been wanting to talk about since I started, right? But I've never gotten to that yet, but I will, right? Uh, and so he, he launches this project, right, of, of saying we need to think through climate finance in a speech three months before the Paris Agreement uh, was negotiated in September 2015, a speech that's called The Tragedy of the Horizon. You, I want you to look at that speech. Okay, that's a really powerful speech. The Tragedy of the Horizon. Mark Carney, Carney is C-A-R-N-E-Y. And that kind of addresses your question too, right? Uh, because you understand what happens if we think through a really long-term problem, <laughs> right? Uh, and so he, he, he lays out what happens when you think through a really long-term problem, which is that you have risks you never even thought of to deal with. Yes. Right. Uh, I have a question. Since we are talking about the uh, capitalism and exit capitalism, yes. Yes, so, that's where you have climate finance, yeah. right? So we can say that rich countries can do that, but poor countries, they cannot afford this kind of thing. Right. And uh, what we can see, we, like poor countries, they don't have money for investments in education and in Correct. health insurance and everything. And so how can we deal, because these are the countries that have more natural resources. Mm -hmm. Yes, and they're also, more, they're also by, by and large more exposed to climate change, right? Right. And then we are going to see just migration waves from rich countries right. to poor countries, and we are going to see the exploration again happening. Right, right. So but you can, maybe you can also tell rich countries, you have a choice. You send $1 billion over there, or you have 1 million people coming to you. Take your pick. What's better? <laughs> right. That usually gets the attention of the rich countries, right? But I'm, I was kidding, but I was not kidding, right? The way you best deal with this, right? And 
don't think of me as crazy, right? I've spent whole my, my whole life thinking about those kinds of things, is to have a, a new type of money that's globally created and that gets dedicated to, to climate mitigation and adaptation projects. And that's carbon money, right? And so you have to have climate finance, you have to have carbon money, and then you have a very different system working, right? And that's the key idea in that book, right? The chapter six and seven. Right? But when you have carbon money, you can basically create money out of nothing and then dedicate it to go there. And then when the results are okay, then the money gets destroyed in a very particular way, right? To do this, you have to think through how money works, which is what I've been trying to do, right? Uh, and I'll talk to you about this hopefully at the end. I know there's a lot to talk about, and, uh, but yes. There was another question, yes. Just, just wanted to make a point about the digital and Richard Huh? Yeah. Sure. The, the point about the digital DAOs and Richard Thorne. Yes. I mean, the items they develop are nothing compared to the one used by the IPCC, which are much more detailed. Yes, that. correct. Well, Richard Toll, I don't like in particular that much because he's, he's, he's actually paid by somebody to be optimistic about things, right? So I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to get into all those details, right? Right, right. Well, no, look, look, I, yes, I mean, I got to be careful here because I know that some people know a lot and they know more than I do and then I get exposed to bullshit uh, arguments of my own, right? But... Uh, but the IAAM, right, I did talk to Nordhaus about this, right? He's trying to think this through over much, much longer periods of time and see how the impact works there, right? Yeah, the dice stuff, I mean, the dice Well, they're, do they're redoing new models. This will be dice four and dice five, right? They're, they're working on new models, right? Yeah, right, right, anyway. Uh, The point, the point is this, that there is, a, there is an understanding, uh, and I think that the next assessment report will talk about the fact that you have to have at least a 100-year horizon, right? No, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. There's a reason for that, too. Right? They are ultimately limited models, right? And they're actually... Yeah, they, they, they define the problems pretty narrowly, right? But look, let's go on. So you have the NDCs, right? And when you look at the NDCs, as you rightly pointed out, when you look at them, they're voluntary climate plans, right? Each country basically through the NDC commits itself to defining a climate plan, right? And it's a five-year period. And it's supposed to get progressively more ambitious so there's, it's the, these, these NDCs are, are set up to become progressively more ambitious. Right? So they have a 2020 to 2025, and then pretty soon you're going to ask them to do the next round of NDCs, and they're supposed to be more ambitious, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth. Right? 180 other 198 countries have done their NDCs. One of the important facts is that uh, you have two hands. Is this a hand? Yeah. Right, and then your hand is clear too. Uh, just first to the Michelle's question up there. Um, I know you mentioned the, like, the shadow banking industry, but also the transfer pricing. I mean, that would create more uh, if that problem would be uh, adjusted, or at least that would. We would get a lot of money. There would be a lot of money. Yes. Well, when, when we try, one tries to do that, actually. I mean, there's steps. Yes, right. No, absolutely. Money laundering is more complicated today than it was before. Yeah. And also the, I mean, these political issues. I mean, you have four terms of these, uh, you know, political parties. Uh, how, how are you, how are they supposed to put up a hundred-year plan that's supported by... They're the not. Public? They're not supposed to do that. That's why you need to have a different governing mechanism, yeah. right? You, a governance mechanism, right? The, the, key, the key to these issues is how global governance works. That's the key. I mean, ultimately, that is the key. And that's why, you know, it's kind of cool to talk to epoch people, right? And it's, uh, I mean, e e the epoch type masters, there has to be more of those, right? And there are more of those coming, right? Uh, they, 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 they have to work this out. They're, they're there to figure out this global governance. And it cannot just be technocrats, right? It has to be a socially mobilized uh, governance mechanism, right? And I have some ideas about that too. But, uh, 
it requires one element of kind of young, well-trained people, right? Uh, from all over the world. But anyway, what was your question? Um, connected to the nationally de uh, determined contribution is also to the global governance um, mechanism. Key issue, as with a lot of international agreements, there's no real sanction power. So although you define your national contributions, right. in the end, it, it, it's just kind of... Totally correct. Mechanism yes. because although if we define these things and countries can say, oh, we really want to reach this, this is amazing, um, this is what we've been working for, but then other political projects come up because it just gives you more voters, whatever, and they are not rich, so we will never then be able to fulfill the goal. So I yes. think that's the issue. Yes. Look, the global, the global governance mechanisms can never have the force of law because you don't have an international state. You have international law, but it's very tricky, right? How international law works is very tricky. And it works only on very concrete, specific uh, problems that get addressed globally. Sorry? No, I just find it really interesting in a sense that no one wants immigrants, but no one wants to deal with the problem of what caused the immigration. Of course, of course, of course, of course. That is. Clearly, uh, you, I mean, that issue is going to be so much more pressing that it's hard to even, like, uh, uh, respond to it saying yes, right? This is, I mean, we have not seen anything yet, right? No, Essentially, what you should do really in a very radical way is to have no borders at all and let everybody move wherever they want to go and integrate as soon as possible and see how this all plays out. That would be the best thing to do, right? But we're never going to do that, right? But we maybe we'll do that when we are, you know, in 2080 and we have burned up everything. Right? Then we will force this issue like that, right? But until then, we won't, right? Uh, but, but in terms of the global governance, if you have a global governance mechanism that is attractive and remunerative, you create incentives to join it. But you can also have, going beyond that, you can have a global governance mechanism that punishes you implicitly by not being part of it, okay? And when you have that, that's why money and finance are crucially important issues because the, the, the global governance mechanisms that worked or work in history are exactly those, right? Where you have access to resources, right? And if you're part of this, you get access to resources. If you're not part of this, you have to be autarkically on your own, right? And uh, it, it requires some thinking about it, right? Uh, by the way, the best economists were both politicians and, I mean, Keynes, Keynes, for example, was very, very, Keynes was above all, first of all, a diplomat, and then he f fucked up that career when he walked out of Versailles. And then he became an economist, right? Uh, but then he never stopped being a diplomat, and at the end of his life he was again a diplomat, right? When he wrote the, the Bangkok plan, right? So Keynes thought about global governance issues all his life, really. By the way, so did Marx. Yeah. Marx had the great tragedy or virtue of being banned from one country after another. And then he had to figure out, well, how do I move around <laughs> while having a growing influence on the minds of people? Why don't I turn my, my flights into something useful? There's a beautiful movie called The Young Marx. You should see that. Where he exactly is facing that question and figured out how to kind of survive and become Marx. Anyway, uh, but, let's, but let's continue, right? So we have the Green Climate Fund inside the Paris Agreement. We have this objective. We have the nationally determined contributions, right? There's 180 of them. 77 of them give you two climate plans. This is a crucial issue, okay? Fascinating. One of the, my, my dissertation people is working on that, and the more I get from her, uh, she's Iranian, uh, she, she's very vested in this because Iran's future is at stake here, and Iran, they, actually, they're very smart. Ultimately, the theocrats, they're pretty smart. They have young technocrats like her to think through what happens in Iran when the oil is gone, no longer usable. Iran is just basically a, a carbon bubble, right? And they know it, right? 
So, but the point is this, right? In the NDC, 77 of them, you have conditional plans and unconditional plans. Does anybody know the difference? What that means, what's a conditional plan as opposed to an unconditional plan? It's like a minimum maximum strategy. You have a plan that you have, the, con the unconditional plan is you have no help. You're on your own. You're a poor country, right? It gets back to your question, right? Uh, I don't get any help, what do I do? By the way, there are some incredibly interesting climate policies. You should look at Mongolia, Kazakhstan, Ethiopia, Botswana. There's some really serious thinking going on there. It's not a joke. Uh, but then the, the conditional one are conditional on getting both financial and technical help from the rich countries. And these are much more ambitious, somewhat or much more ambitious plans. Right? You can do a lot when you get help, when this is collectively addressed. You can do a lot more. So there's a real interest in making that happen, making that work, beyond just having the Green Climate Fund, right? Last week, Governor Brown, who's Governor Brown? Jerry Brown. You don't know Jerry Brown? Dr. Moonshot? No, you're not American. He's like a relic of the past, right? <laughs> But he's currently the governor of California in his 80s. He was already a, 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 you know, a governor in, in the 70s when he was in his 50s, when they called him the moonshot, because he was always completely utopian and drugged. Uh, the, the, the son of a, another great governor of California, so this is a whole dynasty, right? But he's, he, California is interesting, and in a deep life or death battle with the Trump administration. But he, call, he called for a conference. People came and they left $4 billion on his table in a day. So things, you know, that doesn't mean anything, but you know, there's a certain, there's a certain amount of oomph there, right? It's not completely blind, right? Uh, we're not at nothing, we're at something, at the beginning of something, right? Um, just, again, Google Jerry Brown, environmental policy. Read what I wrote about him in the book, you know, in chapter four, middle of the chapter four. So there's climate policy, right? Climate policy is interesting because it gets us to this whole question, what does it take to get this goal of 2%, make it achievable of sorts, right? This so-called transformation, the transition to a low carbon economy. Right? Because basically what's implied here, when you say two degrees, you, you have to target a certain level of greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere, right? And it's 450 milli parts, right? We're now at 400. And uh, so we don't have a lot left, right, to go up there. Uh, and it means that we have a finite carbon budget, right? So the, the logic of a two degree goal is to set a ceiling on how much greenhouse gases you want to have in the atmosphere. And then you look at where you are right now. And then you say, okay, in order to go from here to here, not here, I have to have a carbon budget. Okay? Which is basically a thousand gigatons. Right? We, we emit about 40 gigatons a year, right? Uh, so if we don't do anything, uh, you know, uh, we're going to reach this relatively fast, right, in 25 years. Uh, so we have like 25 years to get this under control in a way, right? Uh, so the implied thing is that everybody, we have a carbon budget, then you have to disaggregate this into a carbon budget for different industries, for different countries, basically for everybody, right? Everybody needs to run around eventually with a carbon budget, just as everybody runs around with a money budget, okay? And when we get to the point where the carbon budget is as important as your money budget, then, we, then we're fine, right? For this, you also need to be able to measure carbon emissions. We are nowhere near that, right? We don't measure carbon emissions at all. We measure it in a very weird way. So we also have a whole technological revolution to, to, to work out how we actually measure emissions, right? and trace them. 
That's a very complicated question, by the way. Uh, but we will operate with a carbon budget. And we need the carbon budget to be in such a way that we can decrease greenhouse gas emissions by 2 to 3% every year on average, all the way to getting to zero net emissions by about 2060, 2070. That's, the, that's what this goal means. Right? We need to have what is called a carbon neutral economy by hopefully by 2060. So then the question is, what does it take to get to that? Okay? And that means fossil fuels have to be phased out. We have to be much more energy efficient. We have to reorganize transportation. More trains, fewer cars. The cars have to change. The cars don't have to just change to be electric cars. We have to figure out how to use cars differently. Right now, what you have is big cars, one person driving in it, and the car sitting there for 95% of the time doing nothing. OK? That's a crazy system. Sorry. Um, so there are you know, these carbon ceilings, uh, yes. carbon taxes for companies. Yes. But could there be a, a tax, in a sense, of, on the con consumer side? Because they are the ones fueling. Of course. If there are no consumers, then there will be no companies. Right, right, right. You can, uh, yes. That would be connected to surveilling every individual in a certain sense and then sanctioning it. Which no, would you put it on the product. So if they buy the product, yeah, there's yeah, all. Yes. How do you want to ensure that everybody just consumes what they're allowed to consume? Uh, no, no, no. You, you, you don't do this. You don't do this. You do it. You do it like you prove to me that you're keeping within the carbon budget, and I give you money if you do. Yeah, okay, that would be. But so people could like. I think the issue with this. running around with a carbon budget, you would and have to have a tracker like a carbon bank. You would have yeah, but you can have a carbon budget like I have my, I have a, I have my blood pressure monitor. Right? Or I have a, my Apple watch measuring my steps, you know. So even if I start dancing, trying to fake the watch, the watch says, hey, you're dancing, you're still doing steps, man. <laughs> yes? Um, I'm surprised you didn't mention like simply downscaling the, the level of economic output. Right. I was going to, I mean, look, I'm, I'm, I'm walking my way through a jungle without any preparation, right? I'm just talking out of my heart. I get interrupted. I get challenged. I get, so yeah, of course. One of the things, and that's a really important discussion, and I'm glad you raised it, is you can, you can take actually fundamentally two approaches to this transition to a low carbon economy, right? And the timing of your question is perfect, right? You can say, listen, the best thing to do is what ecological economists uh, argue. There's a difference between environmental economists and ecological argument, uh, economists. Ecological ar economists basically argue steady state or degrowth, right? And also means population control. Yeah, everybody just one child, right? Or you can say, well, now no, may maybe a better way is just to empower women all over the world. Right? Then you have also f a lot fewer kids, right? Uh, usually, f I mean, we can go into that, but I don't want to get into that. But that's a crucial question, right? The power of women. Uh, so you can do that. And you will do some of that in a way, right? Uh, even if you just go, I mean, if you come back to a environmentally sounder economy, you will basically cut off a whole lot of things. You will have smaller cars, for sure, right? Uh, so the, de the degrowth can be also embedded in a growth model, right? Which is the other way to do it, in a, in a kind of ecologically more sounder growth model, right? Uh, it's a question of what you mean by degrowth and steady state, right? Look, my answer is this. My answer is this, in a way, right? You cannot go to people and say, let's have zero growth and win their support. It's not possible. And I also don't think it's necessary. I, yeah, I do think that at some point you will need very unpopular measures if we are to deal with this in time, or even not in time. Like you, you talk about mitigation and adaptation. Right. And at the time of adaptation, to a very big disaster will come, even then. 
Hmm? Just regulating with unblocking methods. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So yes. Why, why uh, because because mit mitigation is better than adaptation. Adaptation is basically saying we we lost our battle and now we really have to button down, right? Mitigation is still uh, one way you can explore lots of technologies, different types of social organization. You can just, for example, make driving a totally social affair, right? Where you basically have no more private property on cars, but cars are available driving people around. But there's always three or four people in a, in a car. And they drive, you don't have parking uh, garages anymore. You don't need them because the cars are constantly in motion. And what they have is just like stations where they drop off people, recharge their batteries and go on. Then you can do, you can move people around with one fifth to one quarter of all the cars in the world, and you can make them, you know, I mean, that's a totally different system, right? Yeah, I just want to say that I don't believe that people, um, well, people like road, like, of course, because I don't like road. We don't have any road anymore. We are maybe get upset, but only because the link road is on, on point of, like, most of the time, like, it's purchasing power and autonomous. But, like, you don't know, if you don't, you know, most of the time, what the GDP is. Right. Right. Uh, right. Right. But I don't want to get too bogged down. But I have. I mean, I do have some kind of answer that is perhaps fittingly interesting. The question of degrowth, right, in terms of just preserving the environment better, right, is also going to be connected with these. The, what will certainly be an unprecedented wave of automation, right? which comes with quantum computing, artificial intelligence, and blockchains. Right? You have three revolutionary technologies that are just being born right now, and when they come together, they will basically allow 80 to 85 percent of all the jobs in the world to be done by machines, predominantly by machines, right? including teaching. Uh, there's still going to be a little bit of a human content, right, in a lot of those jobs, right? I mean, I'm not saying that this will happen, but the technological potential is there, and humans will figure out how to coexist with machines, right? Uh, and we already see a certain fusion of those two, right? You're already part of a machine, and the machine is part of you. You cannot live without your bloody portable, your cell phone. You're, like, no long, you're like castrated when you're done not having it, right? That was not the case when I was around. I didn't have an electric computer either, right? I had to go to a library and, and, and smell and breathe the dust of books that had been sitting there for 80 years. Very different way of living. Uh, but the automation issue and the ecological issue and the content of job issue, right, come together into fundamentally making us rethink what does real economic activity mean and how is it going to unfold and, and so forth, right? So it's, it's part of a much broader question in terms of the nature of work and how it will unfold and how do you get paid, right? How do you get, you know, basic, I mean, everybody can get a basic income and then make whatever they want out of it, right? And then when you have a basic income promise, then the whole question of degrowth becomes a completely different political question, right? Yes. In some way, be able to completely right. decouple the production of economic value and uh, the well, of matter and energy. And yes. this is so far, even with this new technology, will not be possible. Right. So at some point, you need to, right. to downscale the economic value. Right. At some point, you may have to, yes. No, of course not. Right. Yes. They have nice walls. Yes, they're good. Right. Yeah, it's huge. Well, but it also has the miners, right? It can, you know, you don't, I mean, Bitcoin is a particularly uh, unfortunate social organization of, of, a, of a cryptocurrency, right? It doesn't have to be like that. 
Yes. But you also can have quantum computer servers in, in, the, in the future, right? Quantum computing is like a 100th. Uh, we are far away from it, I know. But, yeah, right, right. No, but that's because we're no long, we, we, we're far away from these technologies, but I'm pretty sure that they're going to be there and they're going to be big in 10, 15, 20 years, right? Well, it depends on how much resource goes into thinking about it now. And you can say that there's already a lot of resources going in there, right? But listen, I, yeah, I, mean, I, I do want to advance this argument at some point. Yes? Yeah, um, I was just going to add to this that like, the digitalization by itself will, in my eyes, most materialize the economy. No, it just so shifts. It will, it will rather you know, um, complement uh, the material and energy that we already have, and no one knows where all the electricity will come from. Yeah, we have, I mean, look, we, uh, yes, right. I can also tell you that a small combustion engine car is environmentally friendlier than a large Tesla electric car, okay? Uh, just by its, by its, even for its greenhouse emissions impact, right? Because the, when you have a large electric car, you need a large battery, and if you have a large battery, you need, you need rare, rare earth metals in there that are kind of an environmental disaster to put in there, right? So, we, yes. Yes, I want to get to that. I'm trying to get to this. Yes. As opposed to? As opposed to a circular economy approach or a right. uh, kind of change of lifestyle. Change right, of right, new, correct. Uh, yes, it does. It does, true. it does. It's true. That's a very good point. But before talking about new investments and new technology efficiency, uh, is this carbon budget uh, sufficient to solve the problem that we already have? Like, no, we. No, we, we, I mean, no, the problem with climate change is it's irreversible, right? It's cumulative and irreversible, right? That has to do with the lifespan of these greenhouse gas emissions, right? You either have carbon dioxide, which is incredibly long-lived. It can be there for centuries, but it's certainly there for decades. It depends. It doesn't have a fixed life. Some, some like, and, and, has a very fixed life. It is chemically decomposing, but carbon dioxide has to do with how it floats around, right? Or you have shorter-lived greenhouse gases, but they have a, they're, they're not short-lived. They, they are there for years, but they have a very concentrated warming effect, right? So you have different greenhouse gases, but all of them together accumulate, right? They accumulate, so it's cumulative. So the more you put in there every day, the worse it gets. And they, de they don't decompose in my lifetime, they probably don't decompose in your lifetime. And so that's a problem, right? So the only way you're going to deal with this problem is to have zero emissions. You're always going to have some emissions, but you need to have just enough emissions to be absorbed by the, 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 the natural system, right? So you have, you have inside the environment carbon sinks that are natural absorbers of greenhouse gases. And if you have a system like balanced where you have as many greenhouse gases being emitted as can be absorbed, then you have what is called zero, I mean, you have net zero or you have carbon neutrality. When they talk about a carbon neutral economy, that's what they're talking about. Uh, no, no, adaptation is when you have done damage that you have to respond to, like, like when, what he mentioned, right? When, when, I mean, the Netherlands is below sea level, so they have had a problem with the sea. And basically, when you have rising sea levels, the guy who designed this now is working in New York to figure out how to save New York, right? He was hired after the storm, Sandy. And so they, and, and New York has a plan for $60 billion to build, you know, all around Manhattan absorbers so that the kind of a big storm cannot destroy the city as it did, right? And uh, so that's adaptation. New York City had a storm. 
and the storm was totally devastating. And now it figures out that we cannot, so we now need to adapt to that, right? It's no longer a mitigation issue. We need to build different tunnels, different parks around on the, on the, along the rivers and, and so forth, right? So then you're adapting to something that has already happened. Right? And with mitigation, you're just trying to prevent something from happening, right? Yes? Right. Uh, they also bring different forms of environmental problems and uh, different forms of ecologisms as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was I was wondering if the stressing the the argument of um, emissions and uh, even global uh, uh, warming is the is the way of. It would be much better if we open it more, you know? Yeah. And I mean, look, uh, I think what we need to have as a political strategy, but also really fundamentally as a moral imperative, is to think through the entire sort of sustainability agenda, right? And the sustainability agenda has to do with a lot more than just that, right? It has to do with poverty, it has to do with access to opportunity, it has to do with, you know, political transparency, it has to do with, you know, just basically human rights, right? And uh, so I, the, that's why it says sustainable development, right? And, and, uh, and you need to make that attractive, right? But, but, but the left is imploding, and so the left has a way to go beyond just Green Party politics to have a vision of a, a different society, right? Uh, in which this is one important dimension, but it's not the only one. It cannot be done without the other ones in place, right? Yeah, because, for example, there's lithium garbage, for example, in Yes, but now we have also technology that you can take garbage and make it into an energy source, right? Uh, and the best climate plans have huge emphasis on waste management and turning that into an energy source, right? Uh, that's a big technology out there, right? But look, Climate finance, right? I want to talk a little, bit, a little bit about that, right? Because I'm coming to the conclusion, right? So in the, f the last really important component of the Paris Agreement uh, calls for uh, financial flows to be consistent with a low carbon transition. Right? This is known as the financial flow consistency or flow consistency article of the Paris Agreement. This was a surprise. Right? This was not on the radar screen of a lot of debates. Uh, but it makes sense. It makes sense. A low, uh, just, just to have this transition to a low carbon economy, there are many studies that have figured out how much this might cost but it costs something like $900 trillion in 15 years, right? Which is about two, twice, a little bit more than twice what we're currently spending on infrastructure in the world, right? So it's a fairly significant program. Uh, and for that, you need to organize financial resources, obviously, right? But financial flow consistency is far deeper than that, and that gets us into this whole field of carbon finance, right? So, two things before I go into the details. First of all, Paris is a good place for that. There's a lot going on in Paris about carbon finance already. It's not an a coincident that it was the Paris Agreement. I don't know what's the chicken, what's the egg here, but now the French have made a commitment uh, to make this agreement uh, work as well as they can, and they're putting resources. Their banks put resources in there, their asset management companies put resources in there. So that's one thing, right? Uh, Paris is good for that. And other places may follow, right? Uh, we have already here just, we ha I have three dissertation students that work with carbon finance. Two of them are working in firms already. They have what is called CIFRI contracts, where they do the dissertation while they're working uh, daily you know, in carbon finance. Uh, we have a, f a bunch of teachers here, right? 
Sandra Rigaud and Helen Torgman. You will have probably have Helen Torgman herself. Uh, yeah, so there's things happening. But, but the point is that this is actually a source of, I mean, there's potentially a lot of jobs there. So this may be something that might be interesting, let's put it this way. Uh, so what are, the big, what are the big elements of carbon finance that we see emerge? Okay. So it's a question of markets, it's a question of institutions, uh, questions of laws, right? and the questions of corporate governance. Right? So the carbon finance is a pretty multi, it's a multifaceted kind of a very amorphous thing that's just beginning. It's like birth. It's a messy thing. Okay, uh, it's being born as we speak, so to speak. Right. Uh, so certain things are clear. For example, green bonds will become big. Already, you have 140, 150 billion dollars of them issued this year. They are very important for developing countries and emerging market economies. Uh, they're a global market, they're being, they're being set up, right? Because you have to figure out who verifies that these are green bonds, right? What makes a green bond green? Right? And, and who, who kind of enforces this, right? So there's a whole set of arguments there, right? But you want to be flexible on the one hand, allow a lot of things to be funded within green bonds because you want to promote this, but at the same time you, do, you don't want to dilute it where everybody says green, what's green about this, you know? So there's a lot of, there's an interesting tension there, yes. Um, could there be an option for companies to say, now you can, uh, you have a 10% tax on your, uh, your carbon emissions, let's say. Yes. Or you have the option to instead invest in green bonds that will also give you some type of uh, returning case. Yes. You, you, you're beginning to see that, right? And uh, you're beginning to see where companies are given a choice. If they follow these criteria, they're sort of in the interest of low carbon transitions, they get a break. They get lower interests. They get longer loan terms. They get, they're, they're allowed to securitize their loans into green bonds. So there's a whole part of green bonds that is just securitizations of loans. Uh, there's all kinds of incentive systems being tested, but they're just being tested now, right? Like, like this year, right? It's like very, very new, right? Um, so there's green bonds. Then there are insurance products because it's a risk question, right? Uh, there's, a, there's an incredible amount of risks involved with climate change. That's a whole other issue, right? The, the, the standard risk management models do not work at all or very, not evidently, easily, okay? So there's a whole question of how do, you, how do you figure out systemic risks for climate change, right? So one part of the work that's being done, and there's some interesting economist, one that I like in particular, Stefano Battiston at the University of Zurich, they look at stress, climate stress testing, right? How do you climate stress test? Uh, yes? I mean, even um, credit rating agencies now start um, including um, economic or environmental Yes, you're right. And I get into that in a minute. Uh, but but we, we are testing insurance products. We're testing, and there's different types of risks. There's slow risks, right? That are in that sense, they're not only timely, they're not time-wise slow, but they're basically not catastrophic events. They're just kind of weather pattern changes, which may be important for, let's say, Austrian ski lift places, right? Or, you know, uh, if you have a lot of bad storms, Belize may not be such a good place to be. So you have weather futures, right? And you also then, for the big events that are traumatically bad climate events, you have catastro catastrophe bonds. Uh, and these are kind of, uh, th there's something happening with derivatives that I'll talk to you about in the Monday class that are event-based derivatives that are going to be much more interesting in the future, okay? Uh, and so they're different from futures, they're event-based, but they're also better adapted to some of the problems with climate change than catastrophe bonds, which are really just catastrophe protections, right? 
So we'll talk more about that in, 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 when we talk about derivatives in, in the class that starts next Monday. But what really matters, and this is where the ratings come in, right, from the rating agencies, is a fundamental change in corporate governance. That's the key of the whole thing in climate finance. So we, right now we have a horribly distorted system of corporate governance, which is called shareholder value maximization, which has a whole history, okay? <laughs> how it got into, how it, put, it was put into place, what's the ideological justification for it by very right-wing Chicago type economists, starting with Friedman, how it was put into place and how it has affected first American firms and then the rest of the world, right? Give, with stock options for, as, you know, pay for the CEOs and short-term horizons and share buybacks and all these distortions, right? But above all, a very short time horizon. Right. So the, there's a counter movement happening and it's happening actually relatively swiftly and interestingly, which is called ESG, Environmental Social Governance. Right. And uh, a number of uh, studies, I mean, this is one thing that kind of the dissertation students are doing, right? They're, they're studying returns of companies that follow ESG uh, criteria as opposed to the traditional shareholder value maximization governance priorities. And the evidence is very clear that the ESG, or given or sufficient periods of time, five to ten years, have better returns. And then you don't need to be moral about it to make it attractive. No, you have more and more measurements to make the point, like labor turnover, for example, right? Uh, you have less turnover of workers. Which minimizes the cost. Huh? Which, Which is absolutely importantly in a minimization, I mean, a reduction of costs, yes. So, yes, so there are studies that are very narrowly focused on just, you know, ROEs uh, and, and other very narrow profit measures, and then there are studies that are much more broadly, right? Uh, conceived, right? So the, the, a crucial part of climate finance is to change how corporations work and think, right? And this is the ESG thing, right? And then you have to distinguish that from greenwashing. What's greenwashing? Do you know what greenwashing is? Yeah, they try to look good, but they're not really doing anything fundamental to be good, right? They're just trying to look good, right? And that, so, so there's also that question, right? Uh, but then, and how should I put this, right? This is complex and very important, right? You, you're going to get first here and then there and then another place, but fundamentally, in the end, all over the world, new guidelines for corporate reporting and assessments, right? And then new uh, criteria for the funds to invest in. Uh, so you have this whole climate-related financial disclosure regime that's getting built now by the FSB in particular but also by certain law, you know, certain, certain politicians. France has uh, something that's known the Article 173, which is this climate-related financial disclosure regime that start, that's starting this year, right? Uh, that's Article 173 of what is known as the uh, Ecological Transition and Green Growth Law which in the, Fran the French just call it transition law, loi de transition énergétique, I mean, it's the loi de transition énergétique et croissance verte. But it's a, like a long name, so people just call it the loi de transition. Um, the Democrats just introduced in the Senate, US Senate, there's a, there's a very important politician behind this, her name is Elizabeth Warren, a major figure of the left in the US, the Climate Risk Disclosure Act. 
Right. So there's, there's a lot of effort in the, in the kind of making firms figure out their role in the climate question right. and disclose it. So that, since I have to finish up, that's the kind of, in a nutshell, very narrowly, how climate finance is beginning. But it's the beginning. There's a lot more going on, right? Uh, and sort of starting to think this through on a longer term basis, right? So that's one thing. And then my, my final idea was this idea of carbon money, right? Because ultimately, the, the key motivational structure of the system is, is money, right? And, having, and, 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 and making that be part of the transition. Uh, the idea of carbon money would be to finance these investment projects for the low carbon transition. It would also be to find a way to deal with what we call stranded assets and how to depreciate them by giving the companies money to do that. What are stranded assets, do you know? I would say that they would lose value even if the transition does not go too fast. They're just going to lose value, right? You're going to have to replace existing assets massively with new assets. You're going to have to like phase out the fossil fuel industry and replace it with renewable energy. So all the oil-fired plants and gas pipelines and, and, and fracking structures in the U.S., they're just going to become worthless, right? high energy consuming cars are going to be worthless, right? Uh, and so you have, to, you have a huge number of assets that are now in place that will have to be removed and end their productive life before they're actually obsolete. That's called stranded assets. Yes? Wouldn't this be uh, for the aim of these green bonds that you can... Yeah, but the, you, you, you have to have a lot of tools. Green bonds are going to be more used for the transfer mechanism towards mitigation efforts in, 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 in relatively strategically placed emerging economies and, and, and poorer economies, right? Isn't the maintaining of value a key component, actually, of the transition? Because money goes with power. So when mm -hmm. there's this... Where's, when there's this threat for like an entire brand industry, or not, like for very big companies, to lose power right. and money through the transition. So, I mean, if we don't solve this, you will not have Yes, any but that's, yes, sorry to interrupt you, yes. You need, you, look, you need to tell the oil companies, you have been oil companies, now you're no longer going to be oil companies because we're not going to use oil anymore, period. And then the oil companies say, what do you mean? <laughs> How do you make me not be an oil company? And I mean, the problem is that just their existing reserves that they have already on their books, right? are five times the carbon budget that we have to keep the temperature below 2%, uh, to, to, 2 degrees, right? So if we allow the oil companies to just go ahead, take the existing reserves they have and burn them up, you don't have, you have 4%, uh, 4, 5, I say 4 degrees Celsius increase in temperature. Just that, right? So you need to tell them, fuck it, over, out, you're done. They say, well, pay me. You think a state like Russia will say, "Yeah, hey, right, now we're becoming a booming economy of feathers, right? No, you have to have some kind of transition, right? And, and, and you have to have them access to funds, right? And so carbon money allows you to do that. You need, look, you need, you need to figure out something about money, right? Two things. I mean, this is a very complicated story, right? Uh, money is a social institution, right? It gets constructed. There's a payment system, right? And uh, there's a, the, the way the money circulates, gets created, and gets valued is a social construction, right? And we have many different money forms already, and they're targeting different parts of the system, right? Uh, whether it's food stamps for poor people in the U.S., that's a money form, right? Your whole ding -a ding grants for this coming here, going there to Bobigny, whatever, that's a, that's a specific money system, right? Some of you have it, some of you don't. 
we, when we talk about shadow banking, we'll identify channels of money that are basically designed to stay within that system to blow up that system, right? You can't use repos outside of shadow banking. Who needs repos? Who uses repos? Nobody knows what repos are except those who make it. Yes? Yes, I talk about a global currency that's called carbon certificates. Yes, yes, they work like special drawing rights, and they're going to be part of the special drawing rights. Can you describe it in more detail? Yeah. Yeah. It's there in chapter seven. <laughs> but I can describe it in more detail, yes. How did, because we just said earlier, okay, so the issue is there's the international governance structure, and it's in has the same, the people put the same trust into it as from a national state? Because it's convertible. And you think that's sufficient? Uh, yeah, I think that, yeah, what I know about money, if you make it work that way, I mean, you need an international issuer, right? Yeah, that's credible. And it's an international issuer that basically is not just credible, but has the power to say, I want Exxon to be no longer Exxon. And I want solar power panels in the desert. Every desert should have, you know, 5,000 square kilometers of solar panels. Gobi, do it. <laughs> uh, Rajasthan, do it. Because I look at the desert, there's nobody there. But I look at the areas around the desert, there are huge cities. Mumbai, New Delhi, right? or Xi'an, Shenzhen, Guangdong, and so forth, right? These are all cities with more than 10 million people, right? And so I can, I can put, you know, solar, okay, solar panels. I mean, they're like solar panels, right? But they're le relatively ecologically sound, right? They will blind the astronauts a little, right? But, you know, I can do that. So I have this international agency that is empowered to issue carbon certificates for these projects. They are earmarked, you can earmark money, right? You can say this particular node is accepted for this particular project. Right? And then you have these carbon certificates. They basically fund this mitigation investment transition. The important thing here is that, I mean, how does this organization work? I call it IMP. Right? Uh, International, international uh, mitigation project, uh, uh, whatever. I forgot what, I, what the I was, but IMP sounded good to me, right? Uh, so I figured out something in reverse how to why I call it IMP, right? And uh, uh, which in other languages calls called MIP. You know, fine, don't worry about it. Uh, so you have carbon certificates, right? And the carbon certificates get passed through the, 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 the national banking systems, right? The banks need to be target, drawn into this, right? So it counts as reserves and is convertible as part of the special drawing rights, which I haven't even talked to you about what they are, but they exist already. And there's a, it's a basket of five currencies, right? Remimbi, uh, pound, uh, yen, euro, and dollars. And you just add the carbon certificates into that basket, right? And then anybody can draw one from the other, right? Uh, but it's a kind of a controlled exchange system, right? It's to go away from, from forex, foreign exchange markets that are kind of freewheeling, right? Uh, that's also useful because my th I, I'm writing three books on capitalism. Right? My third book, which I'm just writing now, is makes the SDRs the key new currency of the world you know, as we go there because we are facing the end of the dollar standard. We're going to a multipolar system with different types of capitalism. It becomes unmanageable potentially, right? Especially when you have trade war, currency wars, then trade wars. And we're going down the wrong route, right? And so we are facing the end of the dollar standard. We have a multipolar capitalism, but we have global problems that we need to have a global governance machine for. And that, that, that requires a different type of international monetary system to organize all these other go governance mechanisms around, right? That's the basic idea of these three books, right? 
Uh, hold on a second. Uh, so the carbon certificates are part of a broader picture, right, that I put together in the, in the final book that I'm writing right now. Right? Uh, so, but the MP, the MP, the point about what I said about global governance, if the MP works the way it could work in my mind, and I'm not the only one, I tell you other people that are thinking about that, uh, then if you're not part of this because you're like Trump, then you're missing out on the transition. Or you're missing out, you have the transition to be done by your own Wall Street banks, good chance, right? And your own, your own companies that are paying sh you know, shares to each other like mad, good chance, right? So you can say, you can say to, the, your, to your electorate, listen, America first, right? Okay, let's get poorer, right? Uh, so if I have a machine of growth, right, because all of this is kind of growth in a way, and good growth, I want to be part of that, right? If I don't want to be part of that, I have to explain it to my electorate, right? Yes? Well, I mean, like, okay, the, the fascinating part, right, other than the technologies yet to develop, and we have a lot of technologies that we have yet to develop, but we already know that we would like to be able to develop them, right? Like how to concentrate larger amounts of biomass and turn them into biofuels, how to use waste and turn it into a source of energy, how to have better cars with, with much more efficient batteries that use up less uh, rare earth ma materials and so forth, right? Uh, how to make cows fart less and all that, right? So we have a lot of ideas that we need to put in there, right? So we basically also need to have a huge plan for research and development without intellectual property rights, where it's basically open source, right? Or commons, knowledge commons, right? We know what we have to do. That's the point. We know what we have to do. We know how to insulate buildings and cool them better, right? We have a pretty good idea as to at least half of the transition is what we have to do, right? And what it costs and who has to do it and how it gets done, et cetera, right? And so that, the MP is a collective organ of getting all the ideas from all over the world, from input from citizens and commons and all that, and then decide on priorities and fund them. It's not a dictator, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's, it's a, 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 a kind of collector of ideas that funds the infrastructure transition, that is tied to the national systems through the central banks. Because one of the things that's gonna happen, central banks will become very importantly part of this whole system, right? You're gonna have green monetary policy. No, 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 it doesn't work like that at all. Sorry. It's earmarked money, okay? It goes into projects, right? It doesn't circulate in the system. That's why it has to be in the banking system, precisely not to make it circulate, right? So, it, hold on. It goes earmarked into projects. The, yes, correct, correct, correct. But in, but in almost all countries in the world, we are between 15 and 30% below potential GDP capacity, okay? In other words, how shall I put this? First of all, you, you, people need to have much better ideas about what causes inflation, right? Uh, there's a lot of bullshit thinking going on about this, right? Uh, it's, it's, you, wanna, you wanna stimulate the economy. You want to use this to stimulate the economy. I, my answer to you is, yeah, bring it on. It just, it has to be properly, the money has to be properly processed as an institution. So there has to be a mechanism of ex ante evaluation. Mon all money is credit money. So all money is tied to debt. All money gets issued by lending, right? right? And so as a loan tied money, it, there's a process of, 
an, an ex ante evaluation of the project that leads to the money creation, right? Then the circulation of the money in the intermediate process, and then the ex, ex post validation, right? And once you know that this is happening, which you, most of the people, people don't even think about because it's just banks making loans, right? Then you have a, then you have a, you have a, I mean, then you get to the core of how money works. And it works differently than you think, okay, more money, more inflation. No, it doesn't work like that. It could be grants for high urgency matters, right? Because what's crucial here, hold on, right? Is to use the carbon certificates, because money has to be destroyed, right? At the end of the loan, when the loan gets repaid, traditionally money gets destroyed, right? And here the money gets destroyed when it has achieved the reduction in emissions. So the, so the carbon certificates are put on top of the loans. The loans get repaid, but that part of the carbon certificates that worked, by their very destructions, that takes care of part of the loan, the debt of the, of the, that was used to finance this, right? So you basically, you're basically turning a social benefit that's outside of the system into something that creates revenue. The social benefit is the reduction of costs, the reduction of the pollution that becomes a public good. You understand what I'm trying to say, right? The key is to internalize, it goes back to our original discussion, right? To internalize this so-called externality, which is much bigger than an externality, so profoundly that it is at the heart of this monetary system that we need to build. So that reductions in emissions as well as keeping below your carbon budget that is allocated to you, are becoming a source of revenue. You want to have businesses whose key business is to make you ecologically more sound, and they get paid by, by, by basically having that as, so, as a source of revenue. The, cost, the idea of this carbon money is that cost avoidance, the avoidance of this emission, becomes a source of revenues. And then you can also say, Oil companies, if you strand your assets and you write them off, you get, for whatever you write them off, you get that money. So then you can diversify out into a different set of technologies, right? You need to make, you need to make, uh, uh, the basic of the idea is, you need to make society organize itself around the rapid reduction of greenhouse gas emissions because we need to get to carbon neutrality. And you need to have an incentive structure that does that, and a funding structure that does that. And when you want to combine the two, it's carbon money. And with carbon money set up like I'm trying to describe to you, you get to a point where cost reductions become revenue streams. Yes? Right. Well, but this is why the ESG thing is so important as a part of that, right? Yeah, so ESG, the environmental social governance, yeah, right? Wants to say, I can, I can make money out of something. You have a, a, a sort of set well, of the may be jam, and I can think well, we assume that the share of the value maximization is no longer the, the overriding. That's, that's why we call it eco capitalism. We have a different type of capitalism, right? Of course, yeah, it won't work if it's. I mean, it gets abused very rapidly and pushed in the wrong directions. You need to have the different components in place, right? So you need to have ESG governance principles, and they need to be enforceable, right? But, but you will see that both the, 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 the Article 173, but above all, Elizabeth Warren's proposal, right, which may never see the light of day, right? But it may very well do, right? Because I think that the reaction to Trump will be a sharp movement to the left in the U.S., right? And then this law will be passed. No, 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 no. You have to, no, no. You have to have it. You ultimately, the idea all the way is to carbon money to you and me. I don't know your name yet, but whoever, right? Uh, you have a carbon budget, I have a carbon budget, I'm, you know, that amount of carbon budget below, uh, my actual carbon budget is below my allocation, I cash in at the end of the year. So, local, local development 
Yes, right, right, absolutely, absolutely. It's crucial that it is completely, it, it, it pervades our system completely. That's crucial. Um, it's funny because, so, the way in which carbon money would work... Um, I, by the way, I've not, I've not mentioned one incredibly important part of it, which is the valuation of the money, right? The value of the money. But that's a crucial question. Just but what I wanted to say is that in the end it means um, using money not as capital anymore. That is... Um, well, but it funds those solar fields. It's an inherently non-capitalist way of doing finance. Well, no, no, it's just a different type of capitalism. I mean... Because in the end, so once you, the, the, the aim is to finance activities, um, operations that are not inherently profitable. That is, uh, planting a tree or reducing the, no, the, I, the carbon doesn't grant money. So you said once this. No, is it's no, is no. It's to redefine what profit is, right? So to, if, if we have the idea from the beginning of this talk that this is not an externality, this is fundamentally a systemic problem, right? You need to then re respond to the systemic risk, the systemic crisis, the systemic problem by changing the system. Okay. And then you just, wait, hold on. You're changing the system, and the way you're changing the system is you integrate the economy into society, then so economic, the social economic structure into the environment. You, you reintegrate these three, right? And then... For this, you need a different type of finance, different type of money than we have today. Agreed, right? And, but the key thing here is to take cost reduction, which is the reduction of emissions that we absolutely have to do or we burn up, right? And make that uh, organizing, one of the key organizing principles of our new type of capitalism, right? And the only way you're going to make cost reductions and organizing principle is you, if you allow business models and initial in initiatives in the social economy that turn this into a source of revenues. That's the point. I don't think this is the only way. If you really look at uh, private actors, uh, businesses, yes. why don't you allow for um, the, the public and the state to be... Of course, but of course. What I mean is if you have... If, if you stop being re uh, reliant on private finance, no, no. you get money creation um, possible for the state itself, just Let like it was in, like 50 years ago, you know? Then you can just start big, big infrastructure project by yes. using money that you can. Is that not which is crucial? Sorry to interrupt. Okay, you got it. Uh, they're not, it's not either or. Uh, look, I'm at the end of my life cycle, okay? I'm almost 70 years old. Right? When I was a kid, I was an Orthodox Jew, right? A Holocaust survivor's child, right? And my parents were like 19th century. And, and, and I was, you know, and, and then my father did something that made me atheist from one day to the next. And then I became religious as a Marxist. And I was a Marxist from when I was 15 to when I was 31. And a crazy Marxist, you know, totally negative kind of Marxist, right? And so nothing could be satisfying me, right? Everything was bullshit. But then I had to work, and I had to work in a job, I had to make policy proposals, and then I realized my Marxism was not very practical because I couldn't talk to this guy from the same fact in any fashion that he would meet. He would see I was crazy. The moment, so I had a long beard, long hair, I had all of that, which is poor, right? And, you know, you go through life, and then I was the post agent center, and I was with the regulationists, so I think all these different theories made it a big mix, which I was talking about in my other course. And then, you know, now I'm here, and I said to myself, well, now I want to just have visions that are kind of interesting policy discussions. Right? That's all I, you know. But it's important that you realize you have to be flexible, not just finding a solid last moment here. You have to be also flexible in terms of what people are thinking, right? And how they're thinking. And you have to work with what you've got. You cannot do this transition without the private sector. It's impossible, mm -hmm. sure. But at the same time, you realize, that, that you realize, no, but you realize, for example, that they will realize themselves that intellectual property rights, they will consider conceive today, are a disaster for us. So you need to then you say, yeah, right, this is a horrible monopoly, right? Don't have intellectual property rights. Go for open source. There's no open source threat. Then go for commons. And then you have a whole discussion about knowledge commons. 
And that's exactly what you have to do. Then you have a pub the key is to find the correct integration and mixture of public and private and social. Because I can tell you also, you know, <laughs> the state can be good or bad. It's not automatically good. Um, so, in the system you described, what about the potential for bubbles, investment bubbles, and technology spending in that way? Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, there's always a potential for bubbles, right? But. I, look, I think I'm gonna, my course on Monday is more about bubbles, and we're going to talk about bubbles, and they, they, they need to be discussed carefully, right? Yeah, because a boom is not a bubble, and, well, I don't want to get into all of but that. Would, but, but yes, but in, uh, yes, there are bubbles. You could endanger the system, right? If you're of course, of course. And um, then the second question I have, you said you want, if I understood you correctly, that you wanted to make it basically the new gold standard. This um, no, 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 no. A gold okay, standard. A gold know. standard is inelastic currency. Yeah, okay, not that. But I meant like new reserve currency. Yes, like yes. You need to get a, no. You need to get away as soon as you can from using national currencies as international medium of exchange. Okay. That's crucial. That's Keynes had that idea, and the idea is as valid today as it was in 1943 when he said, "Do not use the pound or the dollar as world money. It's a disaster." Do you also imagine versus international transfers? Did, so right, of course. Happen? That's the whole idea. Okay. The idea is to understand that the world does best when poorer countries catch up to the richer countries. And then the question is what happens when they have caught up? How do you manage that? This is the problem we have with China and Trump, right? Hmm? Well, you, you, can, you can manage coexistence, right? Yes. No, no, no. But it's an incredibly good question, which gets me to the point I wanted to talk to you about, which is the valuation system, right? Uh, so the way you have to think of this transition, right, is a very large range of projects, right? Can we, I mean, we can agree on that, right? I can specify with you, you know, like 200 projects that are immediately useful, right? Uh, by the way, you can go to something called the marginal abatement curve in McKinsey, and you just Google McKinsey marginal abatement curve, and you see exactly what, what they're doing. They're, they're laying out all the projects globally available, and they're f figure estimating sort of the marginal costs per ton of emission reductions, and they're ranking them, right? And it is the marginal abatement cost, MAC, that defines, the, in, my book, in my proposal, the value of a carbon certificate, right? But, but you have these 180 plants, national plants, right? So I can look at the plan of Costa Rica with the same you know, validity as a plan of the United States. The whole point is that IMP is an international organization that defines priorities, right? Based on a variety of issues. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it, it ha Global governments works only if you have all the layers actively involved in a two-way street. That's crucial, okay? You can't have global governance where one power... You have to have a, a system where everybody has a voice, but the power structures are kind of still kind of integrated in, an, in, a, in a creative way, right? And that needs to be very, a very inclu inclusive way. Well, that's a big question, but it's essentially you t I mean, look, uh, how should I put this, right? Th there's a fantastic, one of my favorite economists in the world living today, who is like my father in a way, in terms of having the influence, is, the, is a French economist called Michel Alieta, Agliata, as the Americans call him, right? And he's the kind of the founder of uh, an approach that I've been part of and so forth, right? And uh, it was Alieta who came up with the carbon money idea, right, a while ago, like eight, seven, eight years ago. And my book kind of takes his proposal, you can see it, and then in chapter seven, and then the added version by the, the best French environmental economist called Urcade. 
and they work together, right? Jean-Charles Lucard and Ma Ma Michel Alieta, and they have this carbon money idea. And then I say, no, this is not going to work so for these reasons, right? And one of the differences, they have a, the carbon certificates that they issue are valued at the social cost of carbon, which is going to go up. Because the more damage, the higher the additional cost of carbon, okay? Because the damage gets bigger and bigger. But if you have something that's a money unit that value goes up, then businesses will wait until the money goes up before they're going to do something because they're going to earn more. They're going to earn more, and that's the wrong motivation, right? So I say the key, the key, the key regulatory system when we're talking about prices and externalities is to have two prices and always think about those two prices together. You have a social cost of carbon, so that anybody who emits has to pay that. That may be a carbon tax. And then you have the value of this carbon certificate, the carbon money, that goes down over time to motivate people to take action now. And that is the marginal abatement of you know, carbon cost curve, right? And so when you have these two systems together, then you have the full carbon money system. Right? You have to punish for the costs, and then you have to turn the avoidance of the cost into a benefit. Yes, it is the, it, no, it would be the World Bank and the IMF together beefed up, <laughs> okay? Uh, the original idea, and this is, this is already a discussion in, in the 1840s that Marx followed very closely, by the way, okay? You, ha you have central banks that are totally kind of neutered, and then you have monetary authorities that are both investment banks as well as central banks, right? And actually... Keynes, original, uh, Keynes had several proposals where he had, he had, the, had the things together, right? So you have, a, you have a monetary authority that can actually transfer real resources, right? It wouldn't be just a World Bank. It would be also a money issuer, like the IMF is with SDRs. But it would be earmarked for projects that are evaluated in advance and validated after. And the success of these projects then allows the carbon certificates to be eliminated as a form of repayment by the borrower. Yes? Maybe you already mentioned this a bit, but uh, don't you think that like, the communication of knowledge and the financialization of the economy are kind of self-reinforcing, like a central pillar in the uh, carbon finance would be like doing some escrow Yes. Yes. You have a mar you have a kind of a Marshall Plan okay. for a global research effort, where uh, anybody can anybody who wants to participate can participate, right? What about like trying to impose a ratio of uh, patents that? No, you don't want to have patents anymore. In, no, no. Look, no. There's no, no, no pa patents. It's too urgent a problem to have patents, right? And patents, the idea was to give innovators an incentive, okay, within a profit logic. The incentive now is that we have common knowledge and we will, we, we will redistribute knowledge just as much as we will re redistribute money and technical assistance. That we need to address this collectively because it's a global problem that's extremely urgent. Right? Uh, I'm, against, I'm against intellectual property rights in general, right? And, uh, but I understand why they were there, right? Uh, I mean, that may be hard to take for the option A people, but maybe that's not hard to take for you. I don't know where you're coming from right now these days, right? Huh? Well, I know that you're from option A, right? Because otherwise you wouldn't ask that question. But, but uh, I don't know what the current ideology is you know, in option A. I used to follow option A first year because my son did epoch option A the first year. Right? Yes? What's the methodology behind the construction of the MAT curve? Because my reading of this is that it's a micro measure, it's specific to the sector, which is the energy sector. Mm -hmm. And if you only rely on that, maybe you will miss the benefit of the sector. I'm not, I wasn't, if I misspoke, I misspoke. I apologize. I was not meant to say use the MAC curve from McKinsey as the value, but I'm saying that the, the, the methodology of that on a broader scale 
would be you include all the project proposals, right? Well, yeah, right. I haven't thought about that. No, I wouldn't want to do that. No, no, I know, but that's an incredibly inter no. I haven't thought about that. That's a that's a really interesting point you're making. Uh, we need to talk about that. Yeah, that's a very. Yeah, I've not thought. I mean, actually, I've not thought about it at all. Right. I I I was just. Uh, right, yeah. Right. Right. Uh, let's say I was under pressure to be fast. Right. And it's never really. Yeah. Right. Well, then you're gonna. Then you don't get that. You don't get that reduction, right? Uh, I still have to pay my. Yes. Employers. Yeah. Well. Uh, yeah, but that's that's the risk you have any time in capitalism. Right? That's why it's still capitalism. There's a risk of failure too. I mean, look. Some things get. Some things get. Uh, social. Some. I mean. Okay. Let's put it this way. When you think about it deeply, right, this system is full of loss socialization mechanisms, right? Uh, I can lay out whatever you want to lay out, right? When pension funds go bust, there's a pension fund guarantee board. There's, there's, different, there's different loss socializations, right? Already in play, you know, let's, I mean, powerful groups, especially those that extract rents, they make sure that, when they're, that, that they're, there's an asymmetry between success and failure. Private profit, socialization of loss, right? And banks are the best example, right? Uh, so that's one answer to my question, right? The other one is that, yeah, you're going to have risks of failure. So that's, that's why it's not, that's why it's still capitalism, right? I just didn't really understand this, right? So with pricing and when Well, because, look, you have to have a system, you have to have a system where you have, uh, like carbon taxes, right? But we need to really think through how this works, where where you where you have beyond a certain amount of emissions that you fall on a predetermined path, you just have to pay for it. You have to pay for it, not in a market. You have to pay for it to society for causing the damage, right? So you have you have to say, if I pollute too much, I'll pay for it. And this has to rise because the damage I'm going to do progressively is going to get worse and worse and worse. I know Francesco mentioned the patents, but, and did you also mention the Creative Commons? So is there another way of combining, I mean, including that more, let's say the pharmaceutical companies? How much, that, how much does the health industry cost just by having these patents that you can instead use in Creative Commons and not really pay for because you don't? No, it's not that you don't really pay for it. You, you, I mean, I mean, you provide a structure. Yeah, I mean, they, I mean, wow. It was unfortunate that you brought up the, the pharmaceuticals, okay? Uh, but again, the answer to that is that there is a deal, there's a global deal to allow the distribution of generic HIV, anti-HIV drugs across the globe that has revolutionized our fight against AIDS, right? Yeah, and many other ones that could be figured out, but now we have all these different patents that are covering different... Right. The patents on pharmaceuticals is, is a, I mean, that's a horrible issue, right? That's one of the reasons why, you know, that's a clear example of intellectual property rights are a bad idea. At the same time, the companies have an issue where only one out of 20 drugs that they work with ends up being a commercial success, right? So what do they do with the 19? So you have to have a very different system of dealing with pharmaceutical companies and medical research than the current healthcare system has. The current healthcare system has that, and then it has this very privatized, very monopoly rent extracting pharmaceutical industry to deal with, right? That does a lot of cross subsidization innately. But that's a problem that's stressing all the healthcare systems in the world. Yeah, right? But that, I mean, that's a huge part of capitalism. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah. I would, I would, I would organize the healthcare system differently, right? but uh, and put a lot more emphasis on actually preventive medic medicine. There's a, by the way, there's a whole lot of medi medical knowledge that can.
get good results without using without using you know, just medications, right? There's also, you know, there's a lot of practices that work very well, right? That uh, uh, when you travel around, you get sick in different places. Suddenly, you have like a toothless lady making you some tea, and you're like, "Whoa, man, I can walk! <laughs> I was dead before." Right? I don't know what drug that was, but it was certainly something that got me going, right? And at some point, you know, somebody put a needle in my, in my, in a pain spot, and the pain spot that was there, the needle was here, and was like, what the hell happened, right? So I have a, some kind of weird, almost delusionary, you know, because I'm always sick when it happens. Somebody just looks at me, and says, "Interesting body," but it's not a, a, a Western doctor, right? <laughs> and it works. The twice that I've had this experience were remarkable. But I also have a chronically ill daughter, and uh, I see what the medical system, how it works in both the alternative way and the non-alternative way, and that just deepens my thinking of, uh, of uh, how it works, right? That what we call, the medical system is one of the most ag aggressive capitalist systems, right? Because there's incredibly inelastic demand, it's surefire demand because like an old car, when you get old, you're just going to fall apart, right? And nobody wants to die. We also have a very bad attitude towards death, right? So the U.S. spends 5% of its GDP on the last six months of people's lives. That's ridiculous! Right? It's ridiculous. You're going to die anyway. Why not just sit back, have a party, and say goodbye, right? With a pill and die. That's like, what the hell, right? But of course, if we did this, then nobody would believe in God. And then another big industry would be gone, right? Sorry to be, I mean, now I'm an atheist, right? I used to be an Orthodox Jew, right? <laughs> In a different life. Yes? You mean the carbon emissions? You mean carbon emissions and based on the, on the development of the rest of the countries. So Where are you from? Brazil. You, you're not underdeveloped anymore. You have a Dutch disease problem. You have all kinds of issues, right? But you're not. I'm sorry to interrupt you, right? Sorry. And now it's based on? Based on what? Based on which criteria you're not underdeveloped anymore? Well, we need to define underdeveloped, right? But, but <laughs> when, whenever I go to Brazil and I go to like even Curitiba or whatever, there's like thousands of people flying around. Now, in 1982, they didn't. Yeah. When I was walking around Campinas, right? Uh, the first time I was in Campinas, it was, everybody was on a bicycle. Next time I went, everybody was on a moped. There were three people on a moped, then there was only one person on a moped, then there was a small car okay. Okay, with lots of people, then there was... I've gone to Campinas since 1981, right? Uh, okay. uh, and Campinas is a good place because it's not Sao Paulo or Rio de Janeiro. It's like in the middle of nowhere. It just happens to have a beautiful university, right? Yeah, but they took very specific seats. So, so to me, the fact that everybody has a satellite making more ugly they already, you know, housing, whatever, uh, people have satellites, they're little, you know, they're little round dishes, you know. Uh, there's, there, I mean, look, the point is that it's a relative issue where you're underdeveloped, right? Everything is always relative, right? Yeah. But, you know, uh, you may argue that Brazil is going through a mess now, but over the last 25 years, and even before Lula, it, 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 you know, it had, a, it had a growth path. It had the growth spurt, right? Now you're depressed because it's a mess. No, yeah, okay, I totally agree. And I agree that these two cities you mentioned may not be considered underdeveloped. But they're also not, they're not, they're not your great financial centers, or they're not your great tourist centers, right? Yes, but, but no, but look, but, but Unicamp, I don't want to 
split hairs with you, right? Unicamp is outside of Campinas. When you walk around in Campinas, it's a big industrial city. Okay, and, and it's totally divided and separated from the campus. No, I mean, look, I don't know whether we argue. Look, maybe we go back to the question, right? <laughs> uh, you're, you're, you're saying to me what? That, 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 that uh, it's not only that uh, now we are, we are poor and now we are, have been suffering, right. but there is a whole uh, past, a whole history. Yes. I uh, have, have favored yes. the countries in Europe and North America. Right. Yes. You have. Yes. You have defined. You have defined the, the most difficult, politi immediately political problem, which is also the reason why the Paris Agreement took 25 years to negotiate. Right. Yeah, yeah. Countries like. Huh? Another question. No, You're going to no, kill me. Just two points, <laughs> Right. Highest, right. The richest country in the world yes. explores it illegally. Right. The, uh, the change in the oil system was made by yes. lobbying. And also, if you think on any heterodox approach on it, uh, we should look more on where is the demand for, the, for these products, which are produced yes. in legal conditions, yes. and how they are produced. Correct. So the demand is two days mainly here. Right. So how to deal with it, how to compensate, and how to deal with the demand that still exists for these products. You asked two incredibly powerful, central, crucial questions. And they are probably the most difficult questions. I'm never going to be able to give an adequate answer, you know, at 4.45, right? But the whole, the whole implication of what I was trying to argue is that, okay, first of all, Something happened in the 1980s, which was the debt crisis, right? And the neoliberal resolution of that, and the, the, the integration of the economies that were touched by the debt crisis, including Brazil, into the global financial markets, uh, and then export-led growth strategies and so forth, where these countries, the emerging markets, they went from developing countries to emerging markets, and then they emerged and they became newly industrialized countries. Just the nomenclature of those countries shows you that they were transforming themselves. And a major part of the additional, we went from 10 gigatons emissions in 1975 to 42 last year, right? So we quadrupled our emissions of greenhouse gases, and half of that is fast, faster growth by China, India, you know, not just the BRICS countries, but many other countries, right? So on that level, we have a collective problem, and we cannot just say to China or Brazil, yeah, right, go pollute more, right? We're going to, you know, so there's a problem, right? We have to do this together in a way. But there has to be this implicit understanding that you deserve a transfer, right? And the whole question depends on this transfer, which was acknowledged by this Green Climate Fund, right? But even the small, initial, it's not so small, it's $100 billion a year, even that gets stuck, right, right now as a problem, right? Uh, so we have this problem of fair and redistributive collective sharing, right? Okay? Uh, that's the, that's, I, I don't know how to answer that question better, right? You cannot just say, yeah, you have the right to pollute like we did, right? Because it's like, yeah, we were, you know, clean one day and we could do all the shit we could do and now we're no longer clean and a little bit of shit is a lot of shit, right? So let's not have more shit, right? What was the other question? I forgot it. Give me one word. Huh? No, no, there was a more, there was a, there was, I just had a flash in my head about what, Yes, right, 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 right. So one thing that, uh, yes, right. So I mentioned it very briefly, but it's the most complicated issue just in terms of, remember I told you that we need to measure carbon emissions really well, that we have no clue how to do this, that we don't have the meters yet, even though we have the potential technology to, to have this like a, like, a, like, my, like a watch, right? Like my heartbeat watch, right? I can have a carbon emission watch, right? 
to do that, right, you have to follow, you have, you have three different types of emission chains, right? They're called scope one, scope two, scope three. And we measure scope one and scope two. Scope three is the whole sequence of the life cycle of a product, right? We always look at the producers and what mess they're making, but we're never looking at the consumers. And it is the consumers who actually create the worst carbon emissions, right? When I buy a car, that's a problem. I drive around the car, right? I take airplane uh, rides. Uh, there's, 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 a whole, there's a whole life cycle chain of a product, and you need to look at the life cycle chain of the whole product to realize what's the fundamental full source of this product as a carbon emitter or greenhouse gas emitter. And that gets us back to this question of the demand, right? It's the demand side, the consumer side, that has to be integrated because that's where two-thirds of the emission sources come from, right? And this will then ultimately require this, this gradual process of figuring out how to deal with this system by measuring how it works. Right. So there's, a, there's, a, there's some, by the way, there's, there's a company here, Carbon 4, Carbon and a, a guy called Alain Grandmont, who is the world specialist on that, right? So just, I'm going to give you the reference, right? If you remind. What you mentioned, is it life cycle assessment? Yeah. No, but, but I was talking to, uh, yeah, not, to, not to be confused with the impact assessment models, right? Which are just macroeconomic, I mean, they make the mix, their models to take the environmental side as a kind of a biophysical model and a macroeconomic model and they mix them together, right? That's different. But yeah, you need a life cycle, you need a sort of a life cycle sequencing of a product's life cycle and the emissions that go with it. That's called scope three emissions. Um, and this can be measured. This guy, Grandmont, uh, I've, he blew my mind twice. I've seen him. <laughs> yeah, right. And he works with Sandra Rigaud here. She was a professor at Paris 13. I think I'm going to, I'm sweaty. I need a shower. Yeah. But yes. Um, yeah, just, just given that capitalism yes. um, has created that international division of, of uh, yeah, production. Yes. Um, so under, under the idea of eco-capitalism, especially from that life cycle um, assessment perspective, would, would we need an eco-capitalism, or let's say an economic system that is decentralized and organized at the local level? I would so... Global value chains and yes. I mean, you're not going to look. Yeah, right. Is I'm interrupting you. Of your, of your conception? Well, I had, yes, it is. I, it is. And a lot of the epoch option A people ended up with, you know, social solidarity economy and the commons thing. And, you know, and so that there's always that. And that's also strong here, by the way, at Paris 13, right? I mean, Korea, is, you have had Korea, right? And he introduced also my son to you, Alexandre. Uh, but uh, we have a whole bunch of new new people coming in, right? And and so we, this is a, this is definitely part of the a poll of Paris 13 that you should be aware of. Batifourier, Barognon. Also, Paris 7 has this. Nathalie Blanc, Antoine Rebarieu. These are the kind of SSE thinkers, right? So social solidarity economy. Yeah, it's absolutely part of it. The point is that you have this very unproductive and ultimately tragic dichotomy of a mixed economy, right? That became degraded with the fall of communism, right? And that now is in deep crisis, including the traditional left-wing parties that embodied that, 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 that uh, dialectical tension, right? Which now is broken down, right? So you have this, you have this great moment of crisis that's both opportunity and danger at the same time because we can also end up with a very fascist type of uh, you know re remaking right and and so the SSE part and the, so the, the kind of think global act local kind of dimension is crucial and it's the it's this tri tripolar thing that needs to be thought through right so, and it has its it has its touch points like the intellectual property rights we were talking about, right? When they become knowledge commons, and that's why I think commons is really 
in my very Marxist days, I was very much into commons, right? Uh, already before it became a new thing, right? I was part of this uh, autonomous movement in, in Italy, right? And we were like crazy. But everything was local, everything was revolutionary, everything was violent, right? <laughs> Thank you. Incredibly good discussion. I have to like, this is a nice way of introducing myself and that, right? Thank you.